So this is suburbia. Lovely, isn't it? It's comfortable. It's what we all want, or is it? That decent job, nice existence. But lately, people have began to complain. They're time poor. It's too hectic. There's something about human nature that wants to be free, wants to explore, wants to escape the normality of life. The family we're about to meet are planning just that. Take a young family with an Irish background, a great home, and swap it out for the roads of Australia and this Winnebago. Meet Pam, a leading sales executive with an idea. We kind of just had it as a dream, and we brought this into our lives. And hubby Kevin, a 3,000 ideas a minute school teacher. My mum would approve of having the head on any fish to serve it up and to cook it. And their four-year-old son, Henry, and five-year-old daughter, Millie. They want to drop their current lifestyle for an Australian adventure. But why would a family leave a great house in the suburbs for a house on wheels? The family plan on travelling around Australia with over 800,000 kilometres of road in Oz. The family will get a chance to see what only a handful of people will see in their travels. We'll be catching up with the family all around Australia at different points. And just in case we miss something, they're going to keep their own video diaries as well. It's not just a road trip around Australia. It's a new life. A new life filled with adventure and problems along the road that they will cherish and remember for the rest of their lives. Join the family on their journey. Somewhere out there. In this first episode of Somewhere Out There, we'll see the family actually buying their RV, sorting out the schooling for the kids, and heading off to the snow for their first adventure. This is it, the big day. The family are picking up their brand new motorhome. <laughs> a spaceship. It's a far cry from the old tin pot on the road, watching out for the flies. This is luxury living by the roadside. I'm thrilled with the inside. The I think we definitely did the right thing by getting the double bunks, didn't we guys? Yeah. And Millie and Henry have already chosen their beds. So yeah, it's finally come. Three years in the planning, so it's very exciting. Well, what are you doing? You're nuts. You're giving up the whole of life as we know it, just to set off. Exactly. Are you mad? Well, I think... Uh, I, I don't even think for a moment um, this is crazy. I, I never, as soon as we, we, we hadn't even planned to buy this when we bought it. It was just that impulse thing. We, we had bought the checkbook around, but I hadn't. I thought we were going to camper trail. So I, I didn't have to check the phones before. And, of course. and the day we got home, I said to Kevin, how do you feel? And he said, excited. Like, we didn't have any feeling of that. We had just made a huge mistake. And isn't it glorious? It is glorious, isn't it? it is. It's not it's lovely. lovely. I, I, we just, oh, a couple of pictures here, a little photograph there, and a, some, our own bed spreads. <laughs> just to sort of make it feel at home. With it Carrot. Right. So I just want to ask you about that, the, the mortgage and that planning. You said it, you've tried to rationalise this decision. You can't really, you can't aggregate, you can't aggregate it. it. No, we we <laughs> analysed for months the whole idea of you know, the depreciation alone on this was going to be so many hotel nights, you know, and it just, right, okay. if we, we, when we overanalyze it from a financial point of view, and then we just said, no, it's not about a financial point of view, it's yeah. not, we're not investing in a house here, this is investing in, in our lifestyle and the yeah. lifestyle 20 years of family and, holidays. and happiness and our, and our kids, but we're just all or nothing kind of people and said, right, this is it. And when it's okay. Well so I suppose this is a modern family adventure, like a real adventure. They just want to give up everything, change a lifestyle for like 10 months. How many of us dream to do that? And how many are really going to do it? Millie, of course, will have to be educated on the road. So Kevin visits the head teacher of Forestville Montessori, Fran Reed, to ask a few questions about the Montessori approach you suggest would be some key things that we could help with her to keep in with what 
you, you would say is important? Well, I, I think in Montessori, the best thing that you can do is really give them real life experiences and have her write about them. Well, for example, if wherever you're going, uh, whatever she happens to see, she can sketch it, she can draw it, she can write about it, she can write one word about her experiences or sentences or as much as she can do and just keep a diary. In order to back up Millie's on the road learning, Kevin and the kids visit the Distance Education Primary School in Sydney's Surrey Hills. That has the various different computer files that you're going to need to download to send audio files back to me. So we, so we need actually go on the internet, it's not just on the CD? It's not just on the CD, you'll need the internet sure. as well. Yeah. Okay, that's good. We usually say, yeah, the morning is a good time to do it. Um, maximum of four hours a day, but you could get the work done in a lot less than that. So Ireland is actually over here as well, isn't it? But um, it's closer to here because the world is round. Henry seems to be having far more fun with the phone than with any of the class material. Amelia gets enough art supplies to fill the whole RV. And we also remember why never to give young kids recorders. Yes, a recorder. It's a recorder. Do you want to blow into it? Yeah. Please. <laughs> Good. I'm sure by the time you get back, you'll have to be able to do it. As Kevin sorts out Millie's education, Pam heads to yet another day of work. Where we need to be. So, obviously, all of the activities around rock solid, private ed, and the channel bounty. A lot of stuff we need to do with the TM. <laughs> but getting close to the big trip, Executive Pam is ready to get out of the office and away from the city. Already on travel time, the family turn up late to their own going away party. Honestly, it's been quite stressful. We've had a few rows when the kids are in bed. We've had a few rows this week. But look, we're packing up our house. We're taking the kids out of school. We're both quitting our jobs. So it's a lot of stuff in the one week. But we have, uh, thankfully, the, the, the car that we're borrowing to uh, get to the, the, sh the shops, run off to get milk in the morning and stuff has arrived anyway. We're the just Ferrari. Gonna, the Ferrari. You're just going to attach that. I can see <laughs> we're going to pull the Ferrari behind us. <laughs> it's important to have a few friends and all that kind of stuff and a bit of a send off. I mean, you deserve it, you know? So this is it. From here, they're not going back to the house because it's not theirs anymore for at least nine months. Sydney. We're going to go down south to a place here called Sutton's Forest to see Mummy's friend Anne from work. What are we going to do tonight? We're going to have a bush barbecue. Adam B, there. Adam B. That's actually where we're staying, except it's Old Abenathy. If Kevin doesn't know how to say words, in Australia he just goes Adam B. It's actually the highest town in New South Wales. So this is kind of where it all started. This is my vision board. So I've been doing these since 2009. The whole concept is that if you have a dream, you should put it on a vision board and then try and look at it every day and visualize how you'll feel when the dream becomes a reality. So to actually think about those feelings and close your eyes and actually imagine what it's going to feel like, we brought this into our lives. The power of evocation. It's the universal power of envisioning something into existence, i.e. thinking about things in a positive way can quite literally make them come true. One of the eggs are broken, I didn't even left it. Oh, great. Yeah. I think we've done remarkably well, but it's absolutely full. Um, this is basically our clothes, mine, Pam's, Millie's and Henry's. With the kids entertained and the camper ready to go, 
the family say goodbye to their house and hello to the open road. Okay guys, are we pretty much ready to go? Yeah. So this is it, the start. We're off, we're on the road. All the preparations have been going on, the packing, the finally getting the kids into the Winnebago. We haven't got far. In fact, we're here at Sydney Fish Markets. The Sydney Fish Market is a real part of Sydney culture, and it's only five minutes away from the CBD. The market was established in 1945 and is the world's third largest fish market. The kids get some hands-on experience and pick up a salmon for dinner. This is a kingfish. Look, feel him. Woo, woo. Feel him. Well, I put him in my mouth. <laughs> you can pick him up here. Fishing boats. Do you want to go have a look? Yeah? we got to see if we can see any of these guys. Pam talks to the fishermen that have been working this market for generations. So how many fish would a net like this pull in? A ton. Wow, amazing. With the catch of the day on board, the family set off towards the Southern Highlands. The family take a chance to stretch their legs and stop at the Australian Botanic Gardens in Mount Anna. Set on 416 hectares of hills and lakes, the gardens have over 4,000 species of flora and it's a pristine haven of beautiful plant life just outside of Sydney. Anne Dickey and Anne's daughter Kirsten live on an acreage in the Southern Highlands. Anne, a former colleague of Pam's, has invited them to stay the night on their property. We weren't sure which way to go. We parked in the fish market and there's a flyover. And we just came and we were that close to taking the whole top off. Some sudden braking on the highway exit has caused a bit of a wardrobe malfunction. I think after a week of this you'll be looking forward to going back to your own house, but it is comfortable for it, yes. Now it's Dickie's turn to get the grand tour of the camper. Kirsten shows Millie the animals. Though the temperature is dropping and stomachs are rumbling, the family gravitate out of the house and towards the fire. I bought the place about 12 years ago yeah. after visiting it for many, many years because my best girlfriend's parents used to live here. You just don't see strangers out here because they don't know we're here. You know, it's, I think in all the time we've lived here, we've seen one random person. Kevin holds court, something we're finding out he's really quite good at. It is the fish that we picked up in the supermarket. Kevin, that would be the fish market. I kind of felt I should sell the head back to them because they're selling their heads at $3 a kilo. And the one says the one with the head, and I said, no, um, I'm not going to probably fit it in whatever we're doing with it anyway, but my mum would approve of having the head on any fish to serve it up and to cook it. I, I, I like cooking and uh, sesame thing, with jeans. It, it, yeah, it makes it. Hang on, Kirsten, get in there and hold half the fish for the laugh. Everyone would be like, who's the cute chick Kevin's, Kevin's met on day one? <laughs> I'm already feeling excitement that this is uh, what we have. This is our home now. And that's what's going to be good about it. Because if we'd done, if we had not done this and had a car and we'd seen in hotels or uh, and all that, it wouldn't mean the same. It would have, wouldn't, we wouldn't have had a home and the kids wouldn't have felt they had a home or anything like that at all. So this is, this is, is our home now. Okay, well, I think Pam's probably just about uh, forgiven me for my outrageous outburst when we took a wrong turn. I mean, 
for 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 Sydney ciders that can't even get out of Sydney. I mean, I just think we're slack when it comes to adventure explorers, and I think we've lost all credibility when we turn around and are nearly in the city again before we get yeah, when we're, we're, we're trying to get to Canberra. It's a beautiful morning in the Southern Highlands. Kevin is wrecked this morning. He is, uh, he was a bit sheepish this morning and then he disappeared into the Winnebago and I went in about five minutes later and he vomited all over the bathroom. So he's in a pretty bad way. I don't know how many bottles of wine, but as I was going to bed, he was coming coming back with two bottles of red under his arm. So uh, he'll be he'll be in a bit of a bad way today. <laughs> Being out of Sydney, we're only probably you know three four hours out of Sydney, and I already feel like we've left our life there, and this is our life now, and it's just so bloody cold. I mean, I'm wearing four, five layers here, and UGG boots, and and I slept in my thermals last night. It's time for breakfast, and the kids get a chance to find some eggs the natural way. Now guys, how many eggs do you reckon you're going to find? Four. Four? Mills, how many do you reckon? Sixteen. Hi, baby. Look at this. They're you. You just go shoot. You go shoot. Stop. Stop. After a fresh egg breakfast, the guys follow Dickie to see why this area is called Hanging Rock. There are many hanging rocks in Australia, but this particular one marks the end of the Great Dividing Range, or rather the fault line that separates the Australian plate from the Pacific. It was also the site of Bushranger Captain Lightfoot's final stand. And in Dickie, quite often see people looking for his hidden stash. Not too long after, the family say goodbye and they're back on the road. sets off on day two, the reality of a year on the road sets in. And we get to grips on fundamentals like, is fuel important? It's one of those things everyone tells about is uh, having a jerry can with uh, spare fuel or you know you can run out of fuel in the outback. How about running out of fuel just on the way to the, <laughs> the snow fields? We've got warning lights, we've got flashing lights, it's been talking to me. We're not going to get to Canberra and I'm hoping every rest area is going to be a McDonald's and a petrol station, but, but it's not looking good. So it was one of those things we haven't calculated. It's all my fault, so I take responsibility for that one. family makes it with only kilometres to spare. This is an important lesson about fuel management, considering the length of the journey to come. Day three, and the family wake to the freezing temperatures of Lake Encumbine. With the excitement in the crispy air, the Australian born kids anticipate their first encounter with snow. It's not long before the landscape changes into a winter paradise.
The road gets icy and the RV is put through its paces. It's becoming very apparent that you can live in it and you can travel anywhere. There's only one thing missing. Perhaps they should have fitted snow chains. I know we should have probably said, okay, well, it'd be sensible, get get some chains. But just the last time, it was fine, and I don't think that, you know, we can we can build a snowman, and we can uh, they can have fun. We can find a place here just to 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 run around for a little while in our gear. It's not skiing, I know that, but. Skating my outfit, it's so slippy. And there's some mining equipment there on the left hand side, and she said uh, that's probably the safest place to pull in and uh, have some fun in the snow. But I can't resist. <laughs> oh, break the window. <laughs> that's... You your vehicle, you don't okay, you're right, thank you. With the dangerous conditions, Kevin and Pam decide not to continue on to the higher snowfields. There's only one thing left to do, and that's rug up and get ready to play in the snow. <laughs> Isn't it fabulous? Here we are, we've come all the way down just a few hours out of Sydney, you've got snow. Not many people know that unless they live in Australia. You would have thought camping, and especially when it's cold, that it would get harder, but it, it's not. It's not rough camping. It's a palace on wheels. Kevin concentrates on breakfast as Pam and the kids have fun in the snow. You know my name isn't Pim, you know that, because my first date with Kevin I said, if we get married, I'm not going to be Pam Pim. Okay. So I, I haven't changed my name, so I, I'm Pam Caldwell. I'm, I, I'm glad we cleared that one. Okay, just, just for you the record, be, you won't be I'm Pam not a Pim. Pim. I think we had a little bit of a period of time there from about four o'clock yesterday evening until six o'clock evening that we were thinking, let's just go home. Pretty, there was a bit of ice and we just had to be a little bit careful Ooh. and thinking, oh, this big beast, it's not going to stop that easily for yeah. once it starts sliding. But it is, we're, we're just living in the moment now that we've we just came up here, set up, sit out here in a beer chairs and have a nice coffee and <laughs> it's just, I'm in heaven, I'm just loving living in the moment again. What do you think Pam? Are you oh look, happy? I think it's great, I, th I think, you know, thank God something good happened because it was hard, the lot, no doubt about it, because we spent most of yesterday in the, in the, in the motorhome. <laughs> I think that's what this journey is yeah. going to be like, it's going to be highs and lows and I think you've got to grab the highs, like just coming down that toboggan, screaming at the top of my lungs, I thought, I'm not sitting in a stuffy office. Often I feel in corporate land, things are so quiet. I want to stand on the, on the desk and shout, yeah, but you can't do it. So that's what's made the morning, right? And the kids have had an absolute blast. What, really, what I really like is our kids are totally a product of us, right? We are both, you know, we fly by the seat of our pants and we always make the best of the situation. They went into Anne and uh, Tricky Dickies and they're, 10 minutes later, Millie's giving Kirsten a hug, yeah. you know? But, but yet when we leave, they're not fretting going yeah. on to the next place. They're saying, where are we going now, Mum? Exactly. And we're still talking. We are. Exactly. We've, had a, We've had a few moments. We've had a few moments. The hardest, crikey. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is just the start. The little test to see if the family can exist in a small, if well-appointed space. I hear you say, well, is that such a big deal? Doesn't everybody travel around Australia in a camper? But this is a family journey, which so far has presented family-sized wonders. For me, it brings up more questions. How will the kids get schooling? What about fuel, power, money? Those of us that are taken aback by snow near Sydney, and I am, will be enthralled by the coast, temperate and tropical. Communities that live by fishing or mining, or even live under the rule of intervention. I find at the end of this episode, 
that we're right back to the tired old suburban evaluation. This isn't at all ordinary. This will be the journey that the whole family will recall. Do you remember that time we lived on the road in Australia? Join us for the rest of this family size odyssey. Somewhere out there. Next week on Somewhere Out There, the family visit a boutique winery, go fishing on the Great Lakes, check out the Holiday Coast in New South Wales, and have dinner by a campfire in Crowdy Head. <laughs>